Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your uh, prompt return. Uh, my name is Neil Betridge, ULAR's uh, Liaison Office of Public Affairs. So it's my pleasure to host or chair this section of the programme, where we are going to be looking at um, some of the lessons that we have already learned from this current research framework programme period, Horizon 2020, which of course is not finished yet, but already there are thoughts about what should follow next, which is of course one of the objectives of today's conference, to see what ideas or consensus we have for that. So we're looking backward in order to look ahead constructively, I think. Um, we have quite a, a full session now, so I'll ask my all speakers to be as concise as, as possible, uh, please. Uh, and uh, for a very good reason, actually, because we have uh, a speaker additional to the programme that you have, um, due to uh, only being able to confirm this uh, more recently. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that from uh, the World Health Organization, we're going to begin this uh, session with a presentation by Mr. Uh, Manfred Huber, uh, who is responsible for uh, a range of issues with WHO, um, including, if I'm correct, uh, long-term uh, healthy aging, long-term care, disability, and I think more recently, long-term rehabilitation also. You were clearly looking for something else to do, uh, Mr. Huber. So it's a great pleasure that you were able to join us in the end, and if you would like to begin that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure to be with you and to share some thoughts uh, about uh, how uh, research is part of the ongoing negotiations we have with member states and that they are reflected in the different strategy and action plans that actually are uh, endorsed by member states. Uh, and uh, from our work with uh, member states, clearly there also come some lessons on w what are the gaps, what are the, some of the gaps of research. And as you will see from my presentation, I will talk less about uh, medical uh, fundamental research, but then more the research which is um, relevant when we move the basic research to practice and then to more the question how to redesign health systems and how to really then uh, evaluate these redesigns um, and also to look into some of the more broader socio-economic uh, consequences of uh, uh, musculoskeletal conditions that are very big as uh, I'm sure all uh, of you are very aware of. Um, so, so these are the, the three points are I want to briefly cover uh, to add some aspects to this already very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation of my colleague this morning. Here, prevalence of long-standing health problems. Uh, you see uh, some muscular collateral conditions. It's here on, from the symptom side, uh, uh, recorded problems with back and neck. It's the, the number one uh, uh, item reason for people and you see how it increases with age. However, you see there's a very high mm, prevalence already in, in middle ages, uh, here between 35, 45, it's already uh, eight in 100 people that say that this is for them a reason of restricted um, functional ability. And this then can have uh, results in uh, longer sick leaves, um, in even early disabilities that have become more and more prevalent for many countries and which at the end are coming up to a social health bill that is quite big. Uh, so the overall, if we add up the overall health bill of sick leave payments and disability payments, it's much more than, it's substantially more than all the spending we do, for example, on unemployment. So we are talking here about a big bill, and of course we want to uh, uh, both uh, uh, make sure that people can live fuller, healthier lives uh, and active uh, and uh, with maximum well-being, but also that they can uh, live up to their aspirations of being an active part also in the labor force. Now, uh, already my colleague this morning has said uh, the, the latest version of the 
uh, non-communicable diseases action plan of the European uh, region uh, has, as a novel, I would say, as a novelty included some of the NCD conditions that are not among the big four, but uh, that are responsible for a big burden of disease, and it's musculoskeletal diseases, it's oral health and mental health. And we try now, with the support of governments, uh, and that's actually what governments have uh, subscribed, to make clear the linkages. Uh, and uh, for musculoskeletal conditions, clearly, there are the joint risk factors. Uh, we, we heard them this morning. Uh, including the worrying uh, epidemics of uh, obesity, but also good muscular skeletal uh, health over the whole life course in itself uh, is important so that people stay active and with more physical activity then we reduce other risk factors. So we, in addressing them, we um, uh, have multiple, health, multiple gains. Um, and um, the, uh, so this is, is one of the supportive interventions. That's basically what is behind it. And it very much uh, copies the, the plan of action for other NCDs, including early, uh, early detection, early treatment, early rehabilitation. So to be um, uh, as, uh, as timely as it's possible to uh, help people living with these conditions. And um, um, there's also, so this is one supporting intervention that has been uh, signed by member states. And, and another one is uh, promotion of health in specific settings. And of course, uh, one of the important settings is uh, the, the, the workplace, because they are the inter action with uh, being able to do your, to um, continue to your work and to live with musculoskeletal uh, disorders is, is a very important and uh, I would say uh, from a social policy perspective some of the really difficult questions for uh, most if not all member states. Now, um, how is research uh, spelled out in the action plans? Uh, now, one of, of course, w when we talk about research, we also often talk about very having the basic uh, data, having the basic epidemiological data. Now, for the high-income countries or for the European Union countries, you may take this more or less for granted, but uh, we have a European WHO region of 53 member states, and there are different levels of uh, overall quality of the statistical systems, uh, I mean, starting with basic uh, uh, demographic and epidemiological data, but also then to more specific research, like, for example, uh, the, the workplace, um, the, the, the consequences of, for example, disability at the workplace. Now, um, but beyond that, uh, also, one part is to uh, support countries with building up national capacity for high quality research uh, on prevention and control and uh, to translate this in high quality uh, and also to translate the research into, into action. And uh, one of the recent publications is actually on how to uh, work on something very specific, which is implementation research. So if you have identified some uh, uh, basic uh, interventions, how would you then define uh, what are targets, how do you monitor them, and how would you then evaluate? So this is, is uh, addressing multiple gaps uh, that are listed here. It's also about the barriers uh, to care. Uh, also the question, are all of the existing interventions uh, the best? Uh, uh, some patients actually might profit from having, uh, for example, less uh, medication rather than more, uh, if there's not a specific uh, really helpful one. And 
then uh, important the research on uh, implementation of what we know about pr primary prevention, but uh, that often requests uh, intersectoral health promotion and our health system or our our societies are often not so well uh, doing well in bringing all players around the table, but increasingly there, to put it positively, there is the uh, recognition that this, this is the way to go, to get everybody around the table. Um, now, where this getting everybody around the table is important, uh, especially of importance is promoting health at the workplace. All countries have a system of occupational health care specialists on that. Then you have the specialists on the clinical side. Um, then you have the social policy makers that design actually the sick benefits uh, and another branch probably than the disability benefits. And uh, then the GP is often the first line access and then he has to decide what to do. Lower back pain, what can I do? Um, okay, will it help uh, have this person for one week or for two weeks on sick leave? Uh, but actually the guidance to decide on these questions is rather weak often. Uh, we do not know much also about these non-directly -me medical interventions. Do they actually help? Uh, does it make you healthier sitting at home or sitting at your desk? And uh, would there maybe a reduced uh, stress at the workplace or reduced schedule be more helpful than uh, basically dropping for some or, or staying away from the work uh, place uh, totally for some time. So these these interfaces between clinical side and then this social side uh, is uh, probably one of the research areas where more research uh, could profit uh, substantially and uh, which again will uh, request that people come together from various various groups. Um, also, again, in Europe, we have more data. We are more data rich in the European Union, but this labor force survey on employment of people with disabilities, you have it every 10 years. Maybe if we would have it every five years or, or intermediate other research might help. <coughs> and <coughs> you benefit from, from my uh, call that I'm losing my voice, so I'm coming to the end. Uh, the one of the, I think, the, the big issues is that we have different data systems. We have somehow heard it today, but it was really about the medical research databases. But we also, we have different databases on sick leave, on disability, uh, on self-reported self disability, and on, on the medical side. Uh, what's happening to people with musculoskeletal decisions. But bringing all this together in one perspective, uh, I mean, talking that science of, of big data, I think is, is really one of the fields we should uh, uh, probably uh, turn much more attention to. And so I, I pose this as, as a final question. Can by linking these different research strands better with big data sets, we make some kind of leap in uh, helping people uh, better? Because from the people's perspective, they are not only struggling with health condition. They also want to stay active in their families, in a job. And often these social systems and the health systems do not do the best job to, to, to bring this together. But Let's take it as an opportunity and especially also for research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we probably have, if it's okay with you, Manfred, time for one quick question, if there is anything from the floor. So, so maybe just something quickly from myself. Um, I, I know you're not a musculoskeletal specialist, so I'm not going to put you on the spot. So maybe thinking about NCDs more generally, um, is it your feeling that there are significant research gaps where clearly we should be, you know, fill it, trying to fill those gaps? Or do you think what is needed is more a kind of meta-analysis of existing research findings in order to make policy recommendations from what we already have? Do you have a feeling either way on this? Um, 
It, it's certainly about the meta research. Um, we, we recently did globally a new guidance on integrated care for older people. And it came up with 13 recommendations and, uh, from the, the usual things uh, like force prevention, incontinence, uh, uh, visual uh, ear and, and, and vision health. And, uh, and that went through all the, all the review process, the guidelines review process, and looked at what is the uh, evidence in the literature. And then you see that uh, sometimes you feel that your recommendation is quite strong, but the evidence actually is not that strong. And that can be for, uh, surprisingly, for even something like uh, doing a review of uh, possible over-medication of older people and, and, and the interface. And so you think that is, should be rather well research, but actually when you do the whole process in a rigor, you see there are our uh, research gaps and just looking at this report you see quite clearly some of the uh, from these 13 recommendations where some would really uh, profit then from from getting additional uh, research so so we have concrete examples but of course it's it's very much about implementation research uh, and and often when we do good practice in countries, it's sometimes a limited scale. So some of the research would also be about how to upscale or how to transfer from some countries to others, to other health systems. So the basic health systems research on how to uh, make it happen. I think from WHO perspective, that's, that's among the most, most important. That's very helpful to know. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We need to uh, move on. Thank you very much, Manfred. That's excellent. It's my pleasure now to welcome to uh, the podium uh, Mr. Cornelius Schmoltz from the European Commission. Uh, and given the very, very important uh, period we're in now, reflecting on the current research framework program, but already starting to look ahead, then I think uh, the perspective from within the Commission is going to be most valuable to the overall objectives of today's conference. So thank you very much for joining us, and we're, we're very keen to hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you for the invitation. Um, so I want to talk mostly about the oh, sorry, um, mostly about the evaluation of societal challenge one, so the health, um, demographic change, and well-being part of Horizon 2020. A um, little bit also about the um, um, overall evaluation of Horizon 2020, and then a very small outlook on um, on the future. So, starting with um, how do we go about evaluate? How do we move towards FP9? We have, of course, multiple mechanisms um, to, that feed into the finally the proposal for the successor program. Very prominently, the Horizon 2020 interim evaluation that you says that in itself, of course, builds then on multiple input. We have foresight exercises. You might have heard of the Bohemia study that very um, prominently collects our evidence of how we think the future will or might look like in different scenarios and how we can prepare for it with research. We have a very important um, publication on the economic case of research and, and innovation from, our, um, from a team in our Directorate General. Then we had, and I have to admit that a slide on their conclusions is missing. I will maybe touch on a few things um, outside the slides. We had the high-level group chaired by Pascal Lamy that looked overall at the evidence gathered in the interim evaluation and puts forward a few principles for the next framework program. And before we make the proposal, we will have an impact assessment looking at the different scenarios that we could choose for FP9 and then eventually uh, come to the timetable. Um, hopefully in the second half of next year, we'll have the proposal for the successor program. In addition, we also have, of course, external drivers, like not only according to this neat methodology where everything is relatively scientific, but we also have political drivers. You know that the EU budget is under intense scrutiny, so we'll have to put a very um, strong emphasis on, on impact. Um, we have, as you're aware, a changing political climate, climate that changes with every national election. And we have a very strong st steer from our president and the three objectives of um, our commissioner, the open science, open um, innovation, and open to the world that you're probably familiar with. Where is the interim evaluation? Another look at this closer placed in our general um, EU policy cycle. So we have a general framework of how we evaluate our past programs and how we plan our next programs. You can see that the um, interim evaluation builds, of course, on what did we think when we were planning Horizon 2020, so the ex-ante impact assessment, the same thing that we're now next year going to have to do for FP9. 
we have, um, we got um, the beginning of last year, the full ex post evaluation of FP7. We have a review of the um, European Institute of Technology. And we just recently, um, earlier this year, uh, earlier this week actually, published the midterm evaluations of the joint technology initiatives and the, um, including IMI in our field, the Innovative Medicines Initiatives, and the Article 185, the public to public partnerships in our field, the European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. And we have the regular monitoring reports that we have every year. So all this goes into the Horizon 2020 interim evaluation. Then very importantly, this maybe should be in red, is the multi-annual financial framework proposal. That comes first before any of the sectoral programs, so including Horizon 2020. We will have um, the leaders of Europe will have to agree on a financial perspective for Europe for the next seven years. Um, so that's of utmost importance. And I think I can say that at the moment, also what we've heard from Parliament, and the signs look good that research is very prominently considered there, but it's, of course, up to the you, the community, as well as to us, to certainly keep that momentum and, um, and, and, and really make this happen. Then, as mentioned, we have the ex ante um, assessment, and eventually we'll also have an ex post and probably also a midterm evaluation. Um, so this is about repeating a little bit the li main lines of Horizon 2020 that you're probably familiar with. Um, effective health promotion, successful efforts to de prevent, detect, detect early, manage, treat, and cure disease, disability, frailty, and reduced functionality, many terms that are ver very relevant for this audience. Comprehensive approach towards poverty-related and neglected diseases. Personalized medicine remains very high on our agenda in every work program and has been so. And then along the broad lines of activities that are outlined in our legal basis in the specific program. What is not on this slide, but what is important for the following slides, is a little bit about the methodology or the data that underlie our interim evaluation. So it's very important to realize when what we call an interim evaluation is actually based on very limited data. So our cutoff for this was end of 2016. You can imagine the program only started in 2014, that in terms of medical research of disease-related research, the results, or even let alone the impact, is not there after two years. So therefore, um, we have to be very careful in what we can say about the impact of Horizon 2020. Basically, we have to extrapolate on earlier data from that we have from FP7 and from previous frame, frame, framework rooms, because we know that the time from research to impact is in medical research at least 10, if not 15 years or longer. Um, so our data, are, we um, do have a number of corporate tools on simply our, um, um, the number of grants, the number of applications. Of course, these things are all readily available, the evaluation results. We used an assessment of the staff in the directorate implementing the societal challenge. We did use what we had in terms of preliminary results of some projects. We were lucky in that we did a very quick response to Ebola very early at the beginning of Horizon 2020. So there we have some great successes, some vaccines, some important studies on the um, effect efficiency of plasma, where we actually could already show a true impact on a management of the disease. Um, we used opinions expressed by stakeholders. Um, and we used some studies that pro were performed on Horizon 2020 in general. And we also, as I mentioned, extrapolated from evidence from past framework programs. And we had um, one um, medium-sized contract with a company specializing this that also looked, for example, at bibliography at the first um, published um, results from our pro um, projects. So what we see now is five slides on the um, results of the evaluation structured according to our impact assessment framework as, or, or to our evaluation framework. The first one is coherence. So there we perform very well. We don't see any coherence issues hampering societal challenge one from delivering. It complements very well national and regional efforts in most of all providing the crucial international collaborative di dimension within Europe, also outside Europe, but primarily within Europe. So you can from the beginning conceive a research project at the multinational level and apply in jointly. That is pretty unique. That probably makes for 95% of really jointly collaboratively financed research projects are from our program. We provide leadership in this um, area. And um, the lack, um, the bottlenecks and weaknesses is something that actually applies to several criteria. We do not have great tools um, um, for user-friendly, exploitable internal and external information. This mostly relates to the results and the impacts. 
Um, so there we do have um, difficulties and we're trying to currently improve this with um, a tool, something like the UK colleagues might be familiar with Research Fish, so a tool that collects more systematically the impact and results of our. On effectiveness, that's maybe the most important. Did it deliver what it promised to deliver? So as far as we can tell, with a great caveat that we are very, very early in time, we think that we are doing well. Um, we have a number, um, if we're extrapolating on the publications that are, were delivered in the first two years, we expect 56,000 publications um, from Horizon 2020. We see that the knowledge, we have some interesting findings from the contract, from the study, that researchers published actually in higher quality journals when their work was related and funded by Societal Challenge 1 than if it was not. You can argue what is cause and what is effect, of course. Maybe they simply put their best ideas forward um, to be funded by us, but that's an encouraging sign. We do foster networking and stimulate innovation. We can also prove in bibliographical analysis that we create sustained networks that survive um, the, the duration of the projects. Now, that's extrapolation from FP7, obviously. Um, and um, we see um, also a sustained level of interest in our program that is at the same time, I think, a sign of success, the oversubscription. It's also, of course, a problem. But it's very important to keep in mind, I always say that because you're probably all familiar with the European Research Council, where very easily it almost automatically comes the together with the adjective excellence. So this is the excellence program. And that is often proven by the very low success rate. Strangely, in our program, people think very differently about a success rate. In our program, it's a huge problem, um, whereas in the ERC, it's a sign of success. I think that's not entirely fair. I think it's very important to also associate our program, SC1, with excellence. And of course, I see the, the impact of oversubscription, and I'll come to that a little bit later. And um, we are still relatively new since FP7 in the field of really clinical trials. This has hugely increased our funding for clinical trials, and there we see some significant problems in implementing the proposals as they were delivered to us. We see lots of um, delays in regulatory affairs and in recruiting patients. We think that this is partially still an effort of educating the scientific or making it clear to the scientific community what we expect, making it clear to evaluators that they don't go for over-ambitious proposals, that proposals that are over-ambitious ambitious are actually punished, and that we really want realistic proposals that can be done in the time that they perceive. It just can't be that all of you are so little experts that 95% of what you propose is delayed. I mean, there's something, you must be expert enough to propose realistic proposals. We know that clinical trials are different, are difficult. They are unexpected hurdles, but it's very important to preempt these and, and, and foresee, um, um, how do you say, contain, uh, contingency measures in the proposal. So that's um, difficulty in terms of efficiency, simplification, one single funding rate, um, also full electronic um, management of the grant. I think these are overall um, um, achievements that are well appreciated, certainly still with some hiccups, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, productivity in terms of scientific output is comparable to the top international research programs. Um, we mobilize the top players. I mentioned oversubscription. We do have a problem in terms of participation of EU 13. I think this is important. I think this will come back in the negotiation for um, FP9. We really need to show that we deliver. So this is also an appeal to the scientific community to really make an effort and detect those talents and integrate those talents that are in EU 13 because um, the numbers um, I, um, are around, I think, 5 or 7 percent of the participations and like less than 5 percent, I think, of the budget. And this corresponds to a population of, um, God, now don't quote me on that, but somewhere but around 10 and 20 percent of the um, widening countries. So EU 13 is actually not maybe correct anymore. Now we speak about widening countries because it includes some old member states and it doesn't include um, all the new member states. And we think that we are relevant, suited to the current challenges. I mentioned, for example, our very rapid response to Ebola. I think this was um, um, a proof of our flexibility to react to political, social, and urgent public health developments. Um, but we do have problems in showing and maybe also in achieving um, translation of results into the market. But I think you're all familiar, and we've actually heard a question and a discussion on that, how difficult that is and how long a road that is, of course. And we think that um, added, there's clearly EU added value on transnational co cooperation, 
on the integration of the relevant activities and participants. Um, we concentrate on, um, in our framework program, we can't do everything. We try to put some focus on some areas. Um, and um, we didn't see any major problems in this area. So our conclusions on the, um, um, the interim evaluations are that there are clear signals that SC1 is being smoothly implemented in spite of the high response, that it produces durable co collaborations, it improves the research capabilities of its participants, it improves the competitiveness of its industrial participants, contributes to training students and researchers, generates patents, creates jobs and SMEs, significantly adds to the stock of useful knowledge, um, also for policymakers, produces new methodologies, guidelines, diagnostic and therapeutic um, tools, contributes to the achievements of the European research area, it shapes global EU and national policy, and is well on track to deliver on its short and longer objectives. At the overall horizon level, key strength are also an attractive, simplified and well-performing um, program. We do deliver value for money and meet our knowledge creating objectives and the strong EU um, added value um, through unique opportunities for mostly this transnational collaborations. Key areas for improvement, underfunding, an important argument towards our, the authorities that decide on the multi-annual financial framework. Um, support for market creating innovation. This is where we need to go in some areas even closer to market. We haven't been maybe good enough in identifying the European Google, Amazon, Uber and really help them um, to deliver. So this is what we're trying to address now through the European Innovation Council pilot. Um, the, um, and we probably need to make more of an effort to outreach to civil society to explain the impacts of our research and innovation to citizens and even involve them in the agenda setting and implementation. I think this is my last or second last slide. So what is missing here is maybe the conclusions of the LAMI group that you might have seen. Otherwise, I just tried it. It's very easy if you Google LAMI report. This is the first hit that you get on Google. So they have delivered 10 recommendations. Um, that starts with a sufficiently resourced program. It goes to, I don't, so I really should have the slide, <laughs> I recommend you to look it up. Uh, but it does um, also mention one of the things that is talked about very much at the moment is the mission-based approach. So the idea to have part of the budget and part of our efforts concentrated on very um, strong delivery-oriented missions. The example always given is the man on the moon. Um, in, in the 60s, but so we're also reflecting on, on missions in our area of health of what we could choose there. But this will certainly be only a part of the program. There will continue to be a strong stream on a broader area of um, research as in Horizon 2020. So um, the timetable um, for this is what has been pre-published earlier um, last week actually is the Horizon 2020 work program for societal challenge, one for, the, for all societal challenges actually for the last three years. So this already integrates some of the findings and addresses some of the findings of the interim evaluation. Um, we do have a publication, um, um, so of this commission communication there, the timing at the moment is not entirely clear. This might be delayed until to early 2018 actually. I did mention that we published the evaluation of the Article 185 and 187 initiatives um, earlier this week. Um, so the rest of this is not yet delivered. Um, the, in 2018, we will then have the multi-annual financial framework that I mentioned, and eventually the commission proposal for the next framework program. This then needs to go through the trilogue with the council and the parliament. Um, in the meantime, we have European parliament elections. We will have a new commission. And if everything goes well, we will be able to launch the ninth framework program properly at the very end of 2020 with the first call for proposals. And um, even if we don't know yet all of, mu that much about FP9, um, you can already meditate the indications from our commissioner who has said that excellence, openness, and impact will continue to be the key elements of also the successor program. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. And if it's okay, maybe I can invite at least maybe one question if there is something for such an important perspective yes please rick can i just wait for the uh, microphone please rick and just a reminder to all contributors please say your name and who you represent when you comment from the floor thank you 
I strongly appreciate that you emphasize the, the excellence aspect, as well as in the positive evaluation, the value for money. Now, well, a lot of people have raised concerns about the fact that due to the oversubscription, actually a lot of money is being lost by people that have not been successful. So does your positive evaluation of value for money also include that aspect where academics and industry have spent lots of time of their paid time and of their money to prepare non-successful proposals? And do you foresee that, for instance, the, um, the pre-selection for given calls is going to be in such a way that the, the oversubscription is something that will be dealt with in the future? So yes, that we are aware of this problem and, uh, and we don't take this lightly. The question is really what the appropriate way to deal with is or the alternative is. The, best, the, the one thing that we all want is more money. So that is clearly number one on our list. Uh, short of that, I think um, we have introduced many two-stage um, evaluations. So that is a clear response to this. I think the economic case on these two stage is maybe not as strong as we or the scientific community would like. We get much feedback that actually preparing even a very short first stage proposal, almost as much effort and, um, and resources as prepare, preparing a two stage proposals. I, the other obvious possibility is to narrow the call, the call topic so much that much less people apply. But that also, of course, limits competition. So we can talk about that in the break, but there is no easy solution for this. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Time for one more? Yes, please. Just from a scientist's view, point of view, I think uh, what is missing from my point of view is kind of a start-up program. Uh, many of these consortia are randomly formed, and I think uh, the oversubscription is not even... Uh, is, is not even a good instrument to select the best of all possible consortia, but it's just the best that are, have been offered and have been formed. But what really is, I think, missing on the European level is kind of a program to prepare such consortia in a kind of a start-up phase with conferences and workshops and so on. Is that planned? So that would mean giving money unconditionally without yes. peer review, basically? For the Just topics. To I mean, for the topics that uh, will be in the call. Or are you more talking about workshops or partnering yeah, exactly. or broker or brokerage European events? Level. Mm -hmm. So we do, have, um, we do have two projects, actually, at the moment still um, in the network of national contact points that offer brokerage events for forming these networks. And we have another one that is ending this year, Fit for Health, that have also a part specific partnering tool for this and that also offer workshops for this forming of consortia. That is always only a very punctual or limited efforts. But th those are the two um, things that we have used to address this. Thank you. I'm sure we could take more questions if we had more time, but unfortunately we don't have more time because we have three more speakers before lunch. So thank you very much, Mr. Schmaltz, for your uh, kind words. Sir. Right. Um, the next three speakers uh, unofficially represent the, uh, the three pillars of ULAR, actually. I say unofficially because the first of these speakers, Tanya Stam, although uh, Vice President of ULAR representing health professionals, is actually speaking uh, to us today from your role as um, Professor of um, uh, Head of Section of Outcomes Research at the Medical University of Vienna. So I should just put that on the record that that's your official perspective here, Tanya. But of course, basically, we want to hear the health professional perspective on this topic. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice uh, introduction. Um, Dear Mr. President, dear honorable guests from WHO and uh, the EU, dear audience, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk here on the perspective of health professionals in rheumatology and what is actually a health professional in rheumatology. It can be um, health professionals in rheumatology play an essential role in clinical care of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. A health professional is a person with a formal training. It can be either a nurse, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, but also a psychologist or a social worker. I have three important areas that I would like to present to you. First of all, health professionals in rheumatology are important first contact points for people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal disorders in terms of early referral, but also in terms of timely and evidence-based treatment, health promotion and prevention at the workplace. And I'm very happy that we have heard already today a lot about this issue. This is an important issue where health professionals work in. 
And of course, research. The program here is about research, and that's also a very important area where I think we need to increase our efforts within the EU. So first of all, health professionals refer patients early to medical specialists if needed. And there is evidence that especially nurses, physiotherapists, and occupational therapists can differentiate between patients with inflammatory joint diseases who need to see a rheumatologist as soon as possible and patients with degenerative non-inflammatory conditions who can be treated by the health professionals on a timely and evidence-based uh, basis. Health professionals in rheumatology provide timely and evidence-based care, and I'm also very happy that Dieter Wieck has already mentioned osteoarthritis as a main or important issue for patients and for uh, older people in, in Europe. What is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease. It affects primarily hips, knees, and hand joints of patients. It leads to pain, to loss of function, to um, stiffness in joints, and of course causes a high socioeconomic burden. A lot of costs uh, are caused by osteoarthritis in general. Uh, rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases are the highest cause for uh, sick leave in Europe. So this is really an important issue. And um, specifically in osteoarthritis, the treatment with drugs and medication is limited. Therefore, evidence-based interventions of health professionals are really important to prevent uh, expensive surgical procedures or to prolong the time until that to increase the quality of life uh, of people and also functioning in, di in daily life. And what are these uh, treatments? The main treatment where we have a lot of evidence is exercise and activity, education, information, and self-management, which is, of course, important, especially when you consider cost-effectiveness within the healthcare systems. This is a disease where patients can really self-manage and uh, use a lot of the information they get from health professionals. And of course, also weight loss if patients are overweight. And there are uh, other things like splints or assistive devices, which are also important, but which are not uh, in the main focus of the treatment. Then, of course, uh, health promotion and prevention at the workplace. That is important for people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. The one issue, and on the other hand, it's important to prevent these diseases. So in terms of health promotion, the interventions of health professionals are important. And when we consider our jobs, or many of our jobs are jobs where we sit the whole day, we sit in front of a computer, then of course, regular short breaks, exercises, physical activity, but also setting up workplaces in an ergonomic way. This is very essential in order to prevent uh, further diseases. But not only sitting on uh, a computer workplace, but also people who have to lift heavy objects. This is also an example where ergonomic principles are essential in order to protect your spine, for example, for further uh, comorbidities. Then, of course, in a world where our activity pace gets faster and faster, we do more and more uh, activities. So having regular rest breaks, thinking about uh, how we pace our activities is also an important issue. And we've recently done a study where we could link, uh, where, we, where we could find initial evidence for linking a balance of activities to the immune system. So our immune system reacts if we have imbalanced uh, activities and we found that several biomarkers reacted uh, on the self-reported uh, balance or imbalance of uh, people. In another FP7 program, we investigated the perspectives of healthy individuals who are at risk uh, at developing a rheumatic disease, namely rheumatoid arthritis. And we have asked these patients about their perspectives in a qualitative multi-center interview study in Europe. And what comes out of that, and I'm also happy that we have talked uh, today already about precision medicine and personalized medicine, and we believe that it's not only biomarkers, we want to stratify our patients, but we also need psychosocial markers where we stratify patient groups in order to have more targeted treatment approaches for certain uh, groups of people. So similar to the biomarker perspective, we can determine psychosocial markers, for example, in qualitative studies, 
to uh, have an effective individualized and personalized treatment for patient groups. So in conclusion, people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases benefit in several ways from health professionals. We need more specialized health professionals in rheumatology, and I think we need more funding for large-scale research projects in the areas of our research in order to establish the necessary evidence for our interventions. So in conclusion, I think that health professionals focus on the daily life of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal conditions, make this life uh, better for the uh, patients and the first uh, issue to consider for health professionals is, of course, uh, the patients with the rheumatic and musculoskeletal disorders. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tanya. I, I think we'll take questions at the end of this trio of presentations, if that's okay. So please keep your questions there. And also, I know that the three speakers are going to be with us all day if we don't have time at the end of the third one. So uh, moving swiftly on to... Um, uh, the next presentation from uh, Professor Bilsma. Um, as as you, I think you all know, uh, Hans is an internationally renowned rheumatologist from Utrecht uh, with over 700 published articles, great experience in um, basic and clinical research, and is um, now going to be covering a, a recent publication from ULAR called the uh, Rumor Map. Uh, and I think the development of the Rumor Map, I would say, Hans, is one of those things which certainly attracts me to ULAR's work, which is around trying to be a proactive and constructive, sometimes perhaps, you know, looking further ahead, rather than simply identifying the problems and the challenges and the issues that we all face. So, so Hans, please, uh, as president of ULAR, the floor is yours. Thank you, Neil. So this is what you all have in your binder. So this is a summary of the Rummer map, and I will discuss a bit about that. So everybody who wants to have the full Rummer map, it's available at the website of EULA. You can download it and you can read through it. And I will tell you a little bit about it. So um, as you have heard, EULA is uh, fostering excellence in education and research in the field of rheumatology. It promotes translation of research advances into daily care and fights for the recognition of the needs of people with RMDs. So that is why we think making some statement about where research should go is an important part of our goal. So we had two speakers already from the WHO, but it's important to realize that recently the WHO named the RMDs as a part of the, non -pri of the priority areas of the work on non-communicable diseases, which is a real support for the work in this field. So why a rumor map? We all know that there's an increasing prevalence of RMDs and their burden on individuals and on the economy. Presently, there is a lack of coordination and integration of research and innovation efforts with respect to long-term planning. And we think there's also a lack of enough support to research and innovation in RMDs. So we try to map the state of development of research and innovation in RMDs. We identified unmet needs and challenges that are out there, and we identified priority areas. So it's important to realize that the field of rheumatology is quite a broad field. We have heard today already about the inflammatory diseases, and examples are, as you see here, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and gout. But there's a large proportion of people with non-inflammatory RMDs, and examples are osteoarthritis, low back pain, neck pain, and osteoporosis. So if we look at the total of these diseases, there are more than 200 different RMDs, and the effect about one in four persons, so that means about 120 million citizens of the EU. Not only are these diseases on its own, but they also go together with a high level of comorbidity. And we have seen that there's a significant increase of prevalence in the last decades, partly because of the aging population and partly because we are now able to recognize diseases earlier on. It's number one cause of disability and the impairment, about 30% what's going on in the workplace, and about 30% of the people with RMDs are disabled or have the mobility or functional severely limited. 
So if you look at the years left with disabilities, you can see it in this slide. So on the, the left side, you see early age on, and then you see uh, the white part is called RMDs. So from the age of 15 years onwards until the end, it's for the graphic, it's about 80 years old, you see the large part, the white part of RMDs being uh, second to the mental and behavioral problems, the most important reason why people live with disability. So it's a really important item. Also, when you look at work, about 60% of all sickness absences in work is due to RMDs. Also, about 60% of cases with permanent incapacity to work and the highest productivity loss. And in 2014, the total cost of work-related RMDs was estimated at over 163 billion euros about one-third for the employers and about two-thirds for the workers themselves. And if you look at the gross national product of the countries in, the, in Europe, the total cost of musculoskeletal disorders are about 2% of the total cost. So did we get some improvement the last 20 years? Indeed we did. So if we look at achievements and breakthroughs, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, when I did my outpatient clinic about 20 years ago, the room was quite crowded with wheelchairs. When I look now at my outpatient department, I hardly see any wheelchair left. So really, there has been an improvement. Another area, osteoarthritis. It's an area where it needs a lot of additional research, but we have made some progress. For instance, there are ways of less invasive surgery, like a distraction of a joint, if you see on the left side, or stem cell repair, and you see on the right side. So also at that area, improvements have been achieved in the last 20 years. So how did we bring together the people for the Rumma map? So we asked about 22 people, including clinicians, scientists, representatives from the health professionals, and of course patients. We had a consultation in the RMD community, and we focused on the most prevalent RMDs. The first stage, what was developed, is from May 2017, and it has been discussed quite well at our Congress and afterwards. And it's very important to realize it's meant to be a dynamic document. That means it's not static, it's, uh, this is how it should be for the coming years. It's something that is under development. So everybody who has good ideas, who wish to comment on priorities, or wish to comment on other items, they're very free to uh, send in their comments, and every year we're going to update this Roma map just to be sure that we are online what's going to happen. So the structure of it is we are defining some priority areas <coughs> based on the impact of these diseases. Then we identify some current unmet needs, and then we recommend research focus areas to address these unmet needs. So these are 20 of the about 200 RMDs that we said, well, those 20 are the first one we should put more emphasis on. And you see a lot of classical diseases, but you also see something like pain, which is also a very important area for development. So some key recommendations are to try to prevent the onset of RMDs, to promote a higher level of early diagnosis, to promote a higher level of secondary prevention. So that means if you have the diagnosis, can you identify whether you have, will have a rather mild development or a severe development and act on that? Um, to raise the visibility and the recognition of RMDs, not only in patients, but also in healthcare providers and policymakers, and of course also for the general public. And then we would like to optimize the care of people with existing RMDs. So we would like to stimulate research that will move towards cure of those with RMDs, ideally drug-free or otherwise drug-maintained, some discussion this morning. And in the absence of this research, reduce the severity and the duration of episodes of the disease leading to a novel concept of treatment. So I'm not going into details. The details will be on the website and a few of them in the, the binder you have here. But we would like to have a successful implementation of this rumor map, and then we expect 
that it will help us to better prevent the onset of RMDs, to improve the early diagnosis of these diseases, to achieve a higher level of secondary prevention, to optimize the care of the people who already have the disease, and then for also a very important one for those patients is to reintegrate these individuals into society. So we think that if you're thinking about future uh, uh, projects for the research for the for the EU that have being a very costly disease that should be accounted for in the money you spend on the research it should be also looking at people at work being employed and also for the social affairs and we think that the EU support is crucial to achieve the excellence in RMDs because we have now the opportunities Means of success are clearly laid out, and we have some examples clearly defined into our Roma map. So that is in very short some ideas about the Roma map, and I'll invite you to read the Roma map at your leisure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Thank you very much, Hans, for covering such a major piece of work so concisely. Thank you. Um, our final speaker for this uh, session is uh, Nele Kayes from uh, Belgium who um, over many years has carried out really outstanding work for the patient association Rumanet here in this country uh, and now equally uh, is, is producing outstanding work for PARE, the, the network of patient organizations which are members of ULAR as the uh, quite recently appointed or elected chair of PARE. So Nele, please, the floor is yours for the patient perspective here. Thank you. Uh, I'm aware that I have like 30 seconds yeah. before you all going to run out for lunch. So I'm going to be very quick. Um, very quickly um, about PARE, you've heard it in, in previous lectures already. We're one of the pillars of ULAR. We have 36 organizations spread over Europe. And what we want to do is actually give a voice to the patients on uh, an international level, make sure that our voices are heard and um, we can create powerful alliances with the patient organizations, but also with other pillars and other stakeholders, of course. Now about research and patient involvement in research. A lot, of, a lot of this has been said already in the past, and we've been working on that within ULAR already since 2010. Um, and we have seen that patients actually can contribute to research in a, in a very good way. And this can go all through the different phases of research. Starting with the topic selection, what are we going to uh, do research on? Also the design and the conduct of the research. And in the end, uh, the dissemination of the results, making sure that the results also go to the general public. Why would you do it? Why would you engage patients in research and in innovation? Well, we think um, it, is, it is quite crucial and it also improves the methodology, but also research outcomes. The input of patients can be very uh, crucial to have um, even better results in the end, add more th um, from, from different views, add some more outcomes here. Credibility of results will go up and then, of course, the translation into clinical practice because we as patients, we um, are much closer to, to the patient community and we um, are able to communicate more to, to the patients, making sure that everything is said in a, in a lay language so everyone can understand. Also, their uh, patients are, are very um, important to contribute there. Um, of course, also for receiving funding, and I think that's, that's a bit of a difficult issue here. It, it might increase the chances of, having, of getting funding for your research project, but you also have to make sure that you don't, you're not going to use the patient only to get the funding, but also make sure that the patient is indeed um, uh, going along with the rest of the, the team. Now we did a little survey among our patient organizations. I told you we have 36 and 16 of them have responded to our questions. The time was August and September, so a very busy period for, for all of us working towards uh, World Arthritis Day. Um, the goal was to gain information about the current situation of research and, and the engagement of patients in research through the different countries. What we've seen is that uh, only a low number of patient organizations are actually doing their own research. And the high involvement is more in communicating with the 
pharmace pharmaceutical companies. So there we see that there's a high involvement. And then in between, you can see organizations who do something about the development of guidelines, research partners who've been involved in uh, lay summaries, the development of lay summaries. And um, you also see that patient organizations are asked to provide a letter for, uh, of interest for a third party, so to actually support kind of interest, uh, uh, some kind of research. And this graph also shows the same, that you see from the very beginning of the research, actually um, making the top deci decisions on the topic, making sure that the research objectives are clear, not many patient organizations are actually involved in that first phase. If you go through the end, the dissemination, lay versions, and making sure that the results are spread, there you can see that more organizations are involved, but still not many. And I think there's um, some um, room for improvement, sure, there. Of course, funding is a big issue. Patient organizations always struggle to get enough funding running the organizations, but especially for uh, research, of course. Also, the awareness of involving patient research partners. You know, people might think that while we get our diagnosis, our, our IQ would go down. It's not the case. We are still able to think and discuss things and, um, you know, we, we are able to do that. Of course, it's a different kind of, of um, involvement, but it's, it's sure it's, it's, um, it's possible. Bureaucracy, we have seen, of course, it, it's very difficult sometimes to hand in a project proposal because of so many things that you have to, to do. And a lot of patient organizations still work with volunteers only, and that makes it quite difficult for them to make sure that everything is in place. Cooperation between different stakeholders, uh, also on European and an international level, but we see it on a national level as well. So these are all big challenges. Now what we could ask from, from the EU is to make sure that policymakers actually go to patient organizations and ask them, what are your priorities? What do you think is important that we should put on the research agenda? And make sure that these points are also considered and not put uh, on, on, in a shovel somewhere um, in the back of the room. And also address universities and pharmaceutical companies that they also go out and reach out to the patients and make sure that their voices are heard. Education, like I said, is one of the main barriers. We have to make sure that not only patients are aware that they can contribute to research, but also the researchers and the other stakeholders that they also know that there are on a national level evil, even patient research partners that are educated, that have, so, have had some training, that they are av um, available to participate in research. Lack of funding and also the regulations between pharmaceutical companies and patient organizations, we have to be careful here. Um, what would also be very, very nice is to have an advisory board in the Ministry of Health to make sure that our voices are heard on a permanent uh, level and not only when the Ministry of Health has some time left. So we'd like to see it more uh, concrete and more uh, permanent. Then, of course, also the input of patients through the development of the research. Like I just said before, we're very capable of talking for ourselves and discussing things and um, learning new things, of course. But we see that uh, people still don't, don't trust us, why we can have a very special input here. Missing cooperations between the researchers and the patient organizations, also on a national level. I think the discussion needs, needs to get open here and um, make sure that the different parties sit around the table, see where they can find each other. Um, it's very important. And then the absence of information about research projects as well. As a patient organization, you don't get the information. You don't know what is running um, or what ideas are there uh, on the, in the outside world. So it would be very, very nice to have some more information links so that patient organizations are also there and kept in the loop. Okay, that was very quickly. <laughs> and um, I'm very sorry, but I stole seven minutes of your lunch. Oh, no, we'll forgive you, Naila. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. Um, well, um, I'm sorry we don't have time for questions, but as I say, do speak to our speakers later. But I'm, I'm sure you, you would agree that we had great added value from our extra speaker, so I hope that's okay with you. Just a quick word about the workshops after lunch. 
please attend the workshop to which you have been allocated, if that's okay with you, because we have tried to balance uh, each workshop to ensure there's a good number of patients and health professionals, etc., in each. Um, if you really can't stand to live with the one you've been given, just have a word with somebody, but otherwise, please try to do that. We will start them at 1.30 still, but I hope 50 minutes is okay for lunch, because we do have networking at the end of the day for those of you who can stay, so plenty of time at the end to catch up with people and, and network. Uh, lunch is being served in the main part of the hotel, quite close to the reception, just behind the reception, and the workshops will be back in this part of the building afterwards. So nothing else to say from me except uh, bon appétit.